Hey, this morning we're kind of continuing on um, from a message we started last week in the Gospel of John chapter 5. We're making our way chapter by chapter, verse by verse through the Gospel of John. And so today we're going to begin at verse 10 of chapter 5 and continue on through about verse 18. Kind of the difficulty with that is it is a bit of a two-part message. And so this is what I want to do. I want to start reading the text from the beginning of verse 1. That's where we started last week. And then I'll continue on to the full section that we're going to cover today. So we kind of set it all in context. So this is one of those mornings where I'm going to read the entire text before we get into it. And if you don't mind, in reverence to the word of the God, would you please stand as I read this morning's text? Again, I'm going to begin at verse 1, but really going to focus in my teaching starting at verse 10. So are we ready here? John chapter 5, verse 1. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been in that condition a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked. And that day was the Sabbath. The Jews therefore said to him who was cured, it is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to carry your bed. He answered them, he who made me well said to me, take up your bed and walk. Then they asked him, Who is the man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? But the one who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn a multitude being in that place. Afterwards, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. For this reason, the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, my father has been working until now and I have been working. Therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father making himself equal with God. Father in heaven, we pray for a blessing now upon your word, of course, but even more so, Lord, upon our hearts and minds that we would receive everything that you have to give us this morning. Fill us with the anticipation of faith right now as we understand your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, you may be seated. In John chapter five, the first nine chapters, the text that we took a look at last Sunday, we saw that Jesus remarkably healed a man. There he was at the Pool of Bethesda at at feast time. There were perhaps hundreds of lame and blind and ill and afflicted people gathered around these pools waiting for a stirring of the water because a legend, a superstition, a story, I can't tell you what it is for sure, was that when those waters were stirred by an angel, the first one in the water would be healed. And Jesus went up to one man who would have never made it into the water first by himself. This one man who needed healing because he had been in a paralyzed condition for 38 years. Jesus went up to him and he told him that he could be healed. And that he could be healed without getting into the water first. That he could be healed by believing in the word that Jesus spoke to him. So Jesus told him to do three impossible things. To rise, to get up to his feet to take up his bed and put it on his shoulder, presumably, or under his arm, and to walk. Three things that were impossible for the man to do. A moment before, Jesus commanded him to do it, and believing in the word of God to him, the man was able to do it, and he stood up, and he was marvelously healed. And we saw last week at the very end of verse 9, there was an ominous line that says, at verse 9, it says, And that day was the Sabbath. You and I, 
some 2,000 years removed from the events. We read that and we go, so? So it was the Sabbath. God did a wonderful thing on the Sabbath. Doesn't that deserve a little more applause than less applause? But friends, we got to understand the people in Jesus's day, especially the religious leaders, didn't see it that way at all. So look with me now at verse 10, where it says, the Jews therefore said to him who was cured, it is the Sabbath, it is not lawful for you to carry your bed. Now, once you notice, first of all, when it says, the Jews therefore said, friends, he's not talking about all the Jewish people in Jerusalem at that time. John uses that phrase, the Jews, almost in a technical sense, to refer to the leadership, especially the religious hierarchy of Israel at that time. You're talking about the high-level scribes, the high-level Pharisees, the high-level Sadducees, those who were rulers of the Jews, especially in a religious sense at that time. That is to whom John refers to when he says, the Jews. And it's that way used familiarly throughout the Gospel of John. And what did they say? Look at it there in verse 10. It is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to carry your bed. Now, carrying your bed, and again, I mentioned this this last week, but it's not wrong to mention it again. He's not talking about a guy carrying a twin, you know, orthopedic there on his back through the streets of Jerusalem. No, he's talking about a bed mat. It would be something substantial, you know, a thick sleeping bag or straw mat that you would roll up and put on your shoulder or carry on your arm. It would be obviously that you were carrying something, but it didn't require superhuman strength to carry it. So here he is walking through the streets and the Jewish leaders see him and instantly say, Sabbath violation, you are carrying your bed on the Sabbath. Now friends, this is what I need you to understand. I want you to understand that this was a violation of the rabbi's interpretation of the commandment against doing work or business on the Sabbath. I want to make it clear. This was not a violation of God's law of the Sabbath but it was a breaking of the human commands interpreting the Sabbath. Do you get the distinction? I think it's a very important distinction to make. You see, understand it this way. If you are familiar with the life of Jesus in the Gospels, you know that he often got into trouble with the religious leaders over this matter of the Sabbath. And when we think about it, there's a lot of important points to consider. First and foremost, the Sabbath that is a day of rest was commanded in the Old Testament. And it was very much a part of the covenant relationship that Israel had with God. And the Sabbath was one of the things that set Israel aside from the other nations. You know, just when we were in Israel a couple weeks ago, our tour guide told us something that I had heard before, but I had forgotten. That ancient visitors, when they visited Israel, when they visited what we call today the Holy Land, they often remarked that there were three remarkable things that they saw in the Holy Land. The three remarkable things were this. Number one, they saw a sea without fish. That's the Dead Sea. Because no fish live in there. It's just a very salty, mineral-filled sea. So they saw a sea without fish. How crazy is that? Secondly, they saw a temple without an idol in it. And that was the temple in Jerusalem. I mean, listen, the ancient world had temples all over the place, but a temple without a statue or idol in it, how strange. But then the third remarkable thing that they saw in Israel was a day without work. Because there was a day in Israel where people didn't work. Businesses were closed. People weren't transporting goods. They weren't doing trucking or transportation or whatever you would want to call it in the ancient equivalent back then. They shut down business for the day and they simply took a day of rest to honor God. This was an absolutely revolutionary thing in the ancient world, but it was widely respected by the Jewish people. Now friends, from a New Testament perspective, we say this, that the Sabbath is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. He is our Sabbath rest. And under the new covenant, we remember the completion of God's work and the rest that he has for his people every day. But friends, the Sabbath isn't only a part of the, new co- excuse me, of the old covenant that God made with Israel. That is an important feature of it. But the Sabbath also goes back to the very beginning where God rested from his work of creation on the seventh day. The Sabbath did not begin in the law of Israel. It began when God created the heavens and the earth. And even though the Sabbath law is fulfilled in Jesus, 
The principle of the Sabbath is a gift of God to humanity that goes beyond Israel. It goes beyond the old covenant. Let me put it to you this way. We work better and we live better with a day of rest, one in seven. We just do. That's how God made us. And that's not part of the old covenant or the Old Testament law. That's part of creation going back to Genesis chapter one. I have to say, even as I speak those words, I feel conviction in my own spirit. My, my wife, Ingalil, she's smiling to me from the front row. And, and, and God forbid that I would project what she's thinking, but I can predict what she's thinking right now. <laughs> she's thinking, when do you take a day off in seven, mister? And I find it a great challenge. I actually do. And, uh, and it's something that I got to deal with in my own life. It's very difficult for me to turn down an appointment offer because I say, well, forget, I'm not going to see anybody on this day. I look at my calendar, well, it's an open day. I can meet with this person and they want to see me. And if I can't meet with them this day, it might be 10 more days until I can see them. It's just, it's just very easy for me to rationalize away instead of just saying, no, this is an empty day and it's going to stay empty. That's it. No studying, no preaching, no, uh, you know, preparing for my next Bible study, no meeting with people and that. It, I got to say, that's a very difficult thing for me, but I will tell you this, undeniably, I work better when I have it. I live better when I have it. So this is a gift of God given to us in creation itself. But when it comes to the law of the Sabbath, Jesus kept it perfectly. Jesus never violated God's command of the Sabbath. Yet in the days of Jesus, there was more than the, to the Sabbath than the laws that God said do not work one day in seven. There was also the human laws that were there to interpret and explain and to protect the Sabbath. You see, in the days of Jesus, rabbis debated it. And we have this because we have their written records. They, they debated things like this. Can a man carry a needle in his robe on the Sabbath? Is that breaking the Sabbath? Can a man wear an artificial leg on the Sabbath? Is that breaking the Sabbath? Can a woman wear her false teeth on the Sabbath? Is that breaking the Sabbath? You see how intricate it could get? How many rules and regulations of man can get built up around a general principle? You see, they put it like this in one place. They said that it broke the Sabbath to tie a knot in a rope, okay? You can't do that on the Sabbath. But they said, putting on your clothing for the day, that was per him, per, permitted. So a woman could tie a knot in her girdle on the Sabbath. That's okay. But you can't tie a knot in a rope. Well, what do you do if on the Sabbath you need to draw water from a well with a bucket? You can't tie the rope to the bucket. That's breaking the Sabbath. But you know what you could do? You could take your wife's girdle and tie the girdle to the bucket. <laughs> And then take the other end of the girdle and tie the girdle to the rope and then pull up the rope with the bucket. That was okay to do. And this, do you see what I'm getting at? You have all these man-made regulations trying to interpret and protect and understand the law of God. Matter of fact, rabbis do it today. It was many years ago, but I read in the newspaper many years ago, this news item that came from Jerusalem, where in an Orthodox neighborhood in Jerusalem, a fire started engulfing an apartment on the Sabbath. And the people who saw the fire, they had a big theological discussion that they had to bring to the rabbi. Is it okay for us to call the fire department on the Sabbath? And in the time it took the rabbi to decide, which was about a half hour, about a half hour later, the rabbi said, no, you know what? It is okay to call the fire department. The fire spread to two neighboring apartments. Again, you see how this continues to the present day. So, but understand this. Jesus always kept God's law regarding the Sabbath, but he often offended human traditions and interpretations surrounding the Sabbath. Now, that brings us to verse 10 again, where he says, the Jews therefore said to him who was cured, it is a Sabbath, it's not lawful for you to carry your bed. Now verse 11, he answered them, he who made me well said to me, take up your bed and walk. Then they asked him, who is the man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? But the one who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn a multitude being in that place. Notice this. The Jewish leaders come to this particular man. Why are you carrying your bed on the Sabbath? Who told you to do that? And the guy instantly, if 
I could put it this way, I, I don't mean to sound offensive, the guy instantly rats out Jesus. And he says, why am I carrying my bed? Well, the guy who made me well told me to carry my bed. If he had the power to make me well, I figure he has the power to know whether or not I can do this on the Sabbath. I want you to notice this. The Jewish leaders told the healed man that he was wrong, that he was doing work on the Sabbath. And the man instantly told him, yes, I'll tell you who told me to carry this on the Sabbath, the man who made me well. And I gotta say, this probably seemed very strange to the man who was healed. He was probably confused. He said, listen, today is the Sabbath. And when I came to the Pool of Bethesda today, men had to work to carry me to the Pool of Bethesda because I couldn't walk. If I was not healed today, those same men would have to work to carry me back home. It's less work, me just carrying this little bed mat that I have. Isn't this a net plus for the Sabbath? But again, man trapped in his religious traditions can't see it. I want you to notice the difference. If you look carefully at verse 11, look at how the man refers to Jesus. He refers to Jesus as he who made me well. In the mind of the Jewish leaders, Jesus was the guy who broke the Sabbath. In the mind of the man, he was the one who made me well. And you know what? If he had the power to make me well, if he had the power to tell me, rise, take up your bed and walk, then I'm going to listen to him. And that's exactly what the man did. Now, notice this. Verse 12, they responded, who is the man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? You see, the Jewish leaders didn't want to know who healed you. They didn't want to say, well, who is this man who made you well? We're very interested in this. There's a man who told you, a man who's been crippled for 38 years, and now miraculously, by the power of God, you walk. This is amazing. Tell us who that is. They were completely uninterested in that. What they were interested in was in their human rules being violated. Who told you to carry your bed mat on the Sabbath? And they said, who is this? And the guy says, I don't know. I never even learned his name. And Jesus had slipped away. Look at what it says there in verse 13. For Jesus had withdrawn a multitude being in that place. Jesus didn't want to remain there with the commotion of the man's healing. Because he did not intend to heal that entire multitude surrounding the pool of Bethesda, Jesus said, this is a good time for me to go. I'm just going to disappear into the crowd. And so the man didn't even know where Jesus was or the name of the man who had healed him. Now, verse 14. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. So notice this. Verse 14 says that afterward, Jesus found him. In other words, Jesus made a point to look for this man throughout the crowd. There he is. I must go speak with him. Why did Jesus feel this need to find the man and speak with him? Because even though the man was healed of his physical paralysis, Jesus was concerned about something going on in his heart. Jesus was concerned about something even greater than physical paralysis. Notice what Jesus says here. He says, verse 14, he says, See, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. Friend, I want to assure you, you have been made well. Maybe you've seen a lot of people go into the waters at the pool of Bethesda, and, and they were healed for a day, so to speak, through an adrenaline rush or psychological suggestion or something like that. Well, forget about that, sir. I want you to know you have been made well. You are not going to be paralyzed again. But he says, he says, please understand this. Jesus continued. He said, sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. The implication behind those words, and I have to admit, it's not more than an implication. Jesus does not spell it out. But the implication behind those words is that the man's injury or illness was in some way connected with sin in his past. And if he did not live more wisely, he might end up in a worse situation, both in this life and the next. And again, we don't exactly know what Jesus was getting at. We can make it up in our minds. And it's nothing more than a suggestion, but let's just say that this man, when he was uh, 13, 14 years old, was stealing from his neighbor. He was breaking into his neighbor's home and trying to escape from the roof. And when he was trying to escape from the roof, he fell 
And then he was crippled for 38 years. Maybe Jesus was telling him, Mister, I want you to know, don't go back to that life. If you go back to that life, something worse may come upon you. You've been healed physically, and right now it's easy for you to believe that that's the most important thing in your life. And friends, you know how it is. When somebody's suffering physically, it's just in their mind, it's in their heart, that there could be no greater release in their life than to be healed of their physical affliction. And we understand that. But friends, do you understand that in the big picture, there are worse things than being physically afflicted? There are worse things than paralysis. There are worse things than those physical afflictions. There are the afflictions of the spirit, of the soul, and of the spiritual life. That can be even worse. Now, after this heartfelt, very pastoral word from Jesus to this man, he's really speaking into his life, almost like a counselor, someone to minister to him on a very deep personal level. Look at what the man does in verse 15. It says, the man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. Again, doesn't he seem like a rat? Like an informant, like a telltale. Oh, I, now I know who it was. Before I didn't know who it was, but now he came up to me on the Temple Mount. Now I can tell you exactly. It's Jesus. That guy over there, that's the guy who made me well. That's the guy who told me to break the Sabbath. Now, many people think that this man was something like an informant to the authorities, something like a rat. And there's some ways true to that idea. But listen, it's important to remember that the man faced very serious penalties as a Sabbath breaker. He was very intimidated by the religious system of his day. You see, in theory, the penalties for disobedience on the Sabbath were very serious. One commentator that I read quoted an ancient rabbi to say that if somebody did work on the Sabbath accidentally, they could sacrifice an animal and be forgiven. But if they did work on the Sabbath intentionally, then they should be stoned to death. Now, I'm not saying that it was carried out, but at least that threat was present in the world of Jesus' day. And friends, this is what I want you to understand just for a moment. When people begin to put the traditions of man, when they begin to put human interpretations of the Bible above the Bible itself, there's always an element of religious tyranny in that. There's always a level of domination over other people, and it institutes fear among people. Why did this man run to the authorities and say, it was Jesus, that's the guy? Because he was afraid. And he was afraid not of keeping the Sabbath. That wasn't the problem with the guy at all. He was afraid of the human institutions, of the human religious hierarchy around him. It might sound strange to you for me to say it. But friends, religion can be a very dangerous thing. There can be an institutionalization of power and human traditions and human customs that is oppressive to people. The greatest longing of my heart is that we as a congregation would enjoy the freedom of Jesus Christ and the freedom of the move of the Holy Spirit. And that we would be very careful with human traditions. Friends, every group has their traditions. It's very wrong for a a, a group such as ours to say, well, you know, uh, we don't have traditions in our church. It's other church. Of course we have traditions. This isn't something that just belongs to other church. No, the problem isn't in and of itself having traditions. It's exalting your traditions to the place of Scripture. As long as you keep that square in your mind that this is what the Bible says, and then this is what human traditions say, and human traditions can change. Human traditions can be molded to best suit the purpose at the time. But friends, better be very careful. You never want to change the word of God, but human traditions are always below and subservient to the word of God itself. Now we get to verse 60. For this reason, the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. Did you just do a little, whoa, when you read that verse? Because Jesus healed a man on the Sabbath and told him to carry his sleeping bag from one place to another, they said, kill him. 
because he did this on the Sabbath. Friends, that's the power, even the darkness of human traditions. The healing seemed to make no difference to these people who persecuted Jesus. All they could see was that their religious rules were broken and that those rules were beyond the command of Scripture itself, didn't seem to bother at all. Instead, as verse 16 says, they sought to kill him. The anger, the rage of the religious traditions, it's very difficult for us to explain apart from seeing that it had a spiritual root. There was something so strong about their religious traditions and their systems that it made them want to kill Jesus. For doing what? For healing a man who had been paralyzed for 38 years. That's your crime? Friends, do you see the potential power of religious traditions to do wrong? Friends, you know, in the first great awakening, this happened in the 1700s, there was a lot of controversy because men like George Whitfield and John Wesley preached and brought men and women to Jesus, but they preached, here's a shocker, outside of churches. And it's a very strange idea. They preached out in the open fields, out on the street corners, under the trees, in the marketplaces. And many people thought that it was a sin to preach or to teach the Bible anywhere other than inside of a church. Now, you and I, we smile and go, oh, how silly. But friends, isn't it possible for us to be overcome by religious traditions just the same? Well, Jesus challenges all that. Look at how he continues. Verse 17, it says, But Jesus answered them, My father has been working until now, and I have been working. Therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him, because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Friends, would you look at those words at verse 17 again? My father has been working until now, and I have been working. Jesus did not try to explain that he had not truly worked on the Sabbath. Oh, no, no, you guys misunderstood. I wasn't working on the Sabbath. No, he didn't mess around with that at all. Instead, very boldly, he explained to the religious leaders that his father works on the Sabbath, and therefore Jesus the Son also works on the Sabbath. Friends, this is a mind-blowing answer. Just because you guys accuse me of working on the Sabbath? Just kind of stand back, whoa. Maybe that's true. You know, God doesn't take a day off on the Sabbath, and neither do I. As I picture this scene in my mind, I picture the religious leaders, their mouth agape. Ah! Oh, did he really say that? Did he really say that just as God, his Father, works on the Sabbath... So he does. Friends, I want you to understand one thing from this before we move on. Please understand, God works. He's a working God. My father has been working until now, and I have been working. That's what verse 17 says. God works. The ancient Greek philosopher Philo said, God never stops working, for as it is the property of fire to burn and snow to be cold, so it is the property of God to work. God is a working God. And I want you to know, this was an upsetting thing to the ancient world. You see, in some ways, it was strange that the God of the Bible was presented as a working God. In the ancient world, work was not honored. Work was for slaves and strangers. Work was not for freeborn men. And in the thinking of the ancient world, uh, the, the, the idea of work and greatness, it didn't go together. One preacher, William Morrison, he said that the idea of a working God was completely foreign to the ancient world. He said, it was a revolution when Jesus taught God loves, but it was hardly less of a revolution when he taught that God works. But friends, God is a working God. And that's why he wants his people to be a working people. God works. I mean, he rested the seventh day from his work of creating, but he has never stopped blessing and preserving and guiding everything that he's created. Nothing in this world can exist. Nothing can fulfill its purpose apart from God's work upon it. You know, the Bible very clearly says that God does not slumber or sleep. The Bible very clearly says that God gave the seventh day of rest, not because God was tired, but because man needed the example 
for him to take a rest on the seventh day. So God works. But Jesus added to that, verse 17, my father has been working until now, and I have been working. First of all, notice this. Jesus claimed to have a very special relationship with his father. Very special. In other words, there is a sense in which we can say we are all the offspring of God. We are all created as image. There's a sense in which that's true of all of humanity. But friends, it's a very special sense in which Jesus himself is the son of God. Notice what he continues here in verse 18. This is what offended them so much. But that he also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. This is what I want you to understand. The religious leaders understood Jesus perfectly. There was no doubt. Jesus was making the claim that he was equal to God the Father in heaven. They knew clearly that when Jesus said God was his Father in this unique way, that he declared himself to be equal with God. God. He was claiming that God was his father in a special sense, that he had the same nature as his father. And friends, this is what I want you to understand. He made actually a very sophisticated reference to what we call in Christianity the understanding of the Trinity. He and the father are different persons. The father is not the son and the son is not the father, but they're equally God. And then when you add in what the scriptures say about the Holy Spirit, that's our whole basis for the understanding of the Trinity. So the answer of Jesus, my father works on the Sabbath and so do I, that was bad enough. But when the religious leaders understood that he clearly claimed to be God himself, they were absolutely outraged. Therefore, it says in verse 18, did you notice this? Therefore, the Jews sought to kill him all the more. The thought is simply this. Because a man stood before them and claimed to be God, they understood this man has to die. Now, this is what I want you to understand. If Jesus were not God, then what should he have done in this situation? Should not have Jesus told the religious leaders, whoa, whoa, guys, you've got it all wrong. I never claimed to be God. Why could you misunderstand me on this point? No, 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 I'm not God. And explain why in his exact relationship with the Father. If he were not God, this was the place for him to explain it. But friends, here's the point. And I can't get around how big this is in my mind over the last few years. The radical truth that Jesus is God. And they couldn't get around it in their minds. And all the more they sought to kill him. And we kind of have to end it right here. Next week, we're going to get into this great section where Jesus explains to them what his deity means. Now he's going to sort of unpack this in a marvelous speech, the kind of speech that fills the Gospel of John with so much wonder and amazement. That's for next week as Jesus explains to these religious leaders exactly what he means and exactly where he's going with this. But this is what I want you to get. Four basic things. First of all, have it in your mind, friends. Jesus claimed to be God. Now, you might be saying, that's absurd. How could Jesus be God? I don't believe that he was God. Okay, fine. If you reject it, you reject it. God's given you the choice whether or not you're going to accept it or reject it. This is what I want you to say. Jesus clearly claimed to be God. Is there any doubt? I mean, do we leave this passage with any doubt that Jesus claimed to be God? Now, you're either going to agree with him about what he believed about himself, or you're going to disagree. If you want to disagree, God gives you that right. God will allow you to disagree with him all the way into eternity. But friends, don't deny that this is what Jesus said about himself. Matter of fact, I would hope that each and every one of you would be able to say it about your, for yourself, I should say. Not about yourself, for yourself. What would you say for yourself? Jesus is God. In fact, I think you should just say those words to yourself right now. You see, I, 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 I don't want you to say it all in unison. I'm not going to lead a cheer because I don't want to coerce anybody by manipulation. But man, I just wish you would vocalize it for yourself right now where you're saying, I think you would say it in a whisper right now, Jesus is God. He's God. Even though it's radical, even though the world thinks you're foolish and rejected, this is what he said about himself. Jesus is God. That's the first point. Second point, don't forget this. 
God gave us the Sabbath. And this is the thing I highlight in my own notes for me to apply for myself this week and in the future. God gave us the Sabbath. Number three, understand this, that man's rules are never greater than God's words. Even the religious rules. Man's rules are never greater than God's words. Never. God's words are always higher and always greater. And it's possible to set up rules of man that violate the words of God. And we should never be in that position. And the fourth thing, it's kind of weird for me to say this, but I must. Religious authority can find itself in opposition to Jesus. Friends, all the more reason for you to pray for your leaders and other leaders in God's family. It's possible. It's possible for religious leaders to find themselves in opposition to Jesus. I pray God all the time, keep me humble. Keep me lowly. Keep me centered in your word to be able to make that clear distinction. This is the Bible. This is a man. This is the Bible. This is a man. Because God forbid that I or anybody else would find themselves in opposition to Jesus. Father, this is our prayer. Lord, my earnest prayer this morning is that everybody here would recognize that Jesus is God and that they'd find the courage, even if it's in a whispered voice, to vocalize it, that they'd just be able to say, Jesus is God. Because, Lord, to know you, the first thing about it is to recognize the truth about who you are. And if it is true, which the scriptures show us it's true, that Jesus, you are God, then we want to recognize it. We don't want to resist it. But Lord, in a deeper sense, I pray that you would help me as a man and as a pastor. I pray that you would help us as a congregation to always make the distinction between the word of God and the rules and the traditions of men. Lord, we just want to know which is which, and we want to always give the high place the ultimate place. And Lord, I pray. I pray for those in our midst, Lord, who in some way have been um, oppressed or abused by a religious authority in some way or another. Lord, I pray that you would grant them restoration and freedom. But Jesus, I pray that you would make us a congregation that is safe from that, Lord, that truly where Jesus as God can reign in this place. It is our earnest desire. So move among us towards that end. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.